You are listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. Okay, so welcome everybody. I'm Dr. Coral Surdyfield. I'm a senior research associate at the University of Lincoln, where I lead research around understanding and addressing the health needs of people in the criminal justice system. And it's really nice to see so many people here attending this session um, from all over the world by the looks of it. So I'm, I'm wondering kind of what time of day it is in all these different places, evening here in the UK. Um, and today's session is, is going to be about serious mental illness and challenges for the criminal justice system internationally. And we've got a good panel lined up for uh, what will hopefully be a really interesting discussion tonight. Um, so we have a main presentation from Tonya. And then what we're going to do is ask the rest of our panel to respond to that presentation um, from the perspective of their own country. Um, and as Rob said, this will be recorded, so it's up to you whether or not you want to keep your camera on. Um, and I would advise, obviously, staying on mute throughout the presentation. Um, but if you do have any questions or comments, then feel free to send them into the chat. Um, so we'll make a start. I'll ask um, Tonya to introduce herself first, and then I'll go to the other members of the panel. And just to say that, unfortunately, our speaker from Germany isn't able to make it tonight. He sent apologies. Um, so just to let you know. So Tonya, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, I'm Tanya Van Dainsa. I'm a research associate professor at the School of Social Work at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in the US. Thank you. I'm not sure whether Shelley has joined us yet from Australia. I haven't seen her. No. So Charlie, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Charlie Brooker. I'm honorary professor at the uh, Royal, uh, University of London, Royal Holloway. And I've been working pretty much, I would say, for the last 10 years in this field but particularly within probation, but also um, some prison work too. I think it's longer than 10 years, Charlie. No, surely not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid it might be. <laughs> um, okay, so whilst we wait for Shelley to join, I think we'll, we'll make a start in terms of the presentation. So I'll hand over to you, Tonya, to load up your slides. Perfect. It's okay, good, you can see it, fantastic. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I was tasked with giving a um, good 20-ish minute overview, is that right, Coral? Yeah, okay. that's right. Great. So I'm gonna start uh, with a couple of uh, disclaimers um, and by way of introduction here. So the first thing I wanted to mention, so um, my background, I, I come from a position um, kind of that began in um, mental health treatment. So I started about 20 years ago working in residential treatment with adults with severe and persistent mental illnesses. So we're talking about adults with schizophrenia, um, bipolar disorder, etc. And then I moved kind of to like a care coordination kind of position within a, a managed care environment with a county mental health system. So different from the private system I was working in, went to the public system. And then from there, I was on to research, um, focusing on implementation science and kind of cross-sector, cross-system interventions uh, across mental health and criminal legal systems, primarily with a, with a heavy focus on probation. I'm, I'm telling you all of this for two reasons. One, to just name that I've not been um, you know, a jail administrator, a prison administrator, and so I really am coming at this from mental health services perspective. And then I think for the second reason to just name that these experiences really influence kind of my orientation and views on this specific problem that we're talking about, which is disproportionately high rates in the criminal legal system or criminal justice system of people with serious mental illnesses. So, um, and on that note, just to kind of name um, maybe some controversial uh, <laughs> topics in my own um, my own overview and perspective on this, but I just wanna be clear about my orientation from the outset. So I've already mentioned disproportionately high rates of serious mental illnesses in the criminal justice system. Um, but criminal 
thinking and individual behavior, you know, we can't really think of those two things as the sole contributor to this problem. And neither are criminogenic risk factors, those these are highly empirically associated with criminal behavior. I do personally think that there's a, a hyper focus on these sort of individual level predictors and individual level um, risk factors. And when we do that, we really kind of take away the role or maybe don't pay sufficient attention to the role of systems and organizational behavior in creating this problem. So policies, for example, um, the ways that systems interact or don't interact with each other. So, and, and I'm not saying this to say that we shouldn't have therapeutic treatment for people with serious mental illnesses and criminal justice system, just that treatment alone is not going to solve the problem that we have. So um, my overview that we'll, I'll give today is really focusing more on system level, less on individual level interventions and treatments. The other thing I wanted to name before jumping in is just context. So despite what the description of the talk today suggests, I, I can't tell you what the best interventions are for your country or your context. And it's because of the, the context. So, um, you know, the, the cultural and what we would say sociopolitical context of our countries obviously impacts everything, including how we even define crime and criminalized behavior, even within the United States, what's a crime in one state is not a crime in the next state. The example I always use is marijuana use, for example, not legal in North Carolina, but if I, you know, walk five miles from my house to Virginia, it is legal. And so, so that's, that's one bit of context. And then that means also how we respond to criminalized behavior. Um, we can think about where, where we police in communities, that's going to be different. Um, how we define mental illness, and the, the problem of serious mental illness in the criminal legal system, and then of course, how I respond to it. So all this to say, all of this context um, really impacts what works in our settings. And so that's why I can't say what specific interventions will work across settings. Um, and since this is an international audience, I think that's part of the, the richness of this discussion that we'll have with the panel. So the topics for the this overview, um, the nature of serious mental illness, the needs of people with serious mental illnesses, and then we'll just kind of talk through some challenges uh, that justice systems face. And then rather than specific interventions, we'll just kind of talk through what maybe intervention mapping might look like across systems as a way to think through uh, maybe a more, I don't wanna say universal, but somewhat universal approach to um, figuring out what to do about this, uh, this issue. So the first, the nature of serious mental illness, what do we mean uh, by mental illness? So. You know, I think it's important to make sure that we're either talking about the same thing or acknowledging the fact that our definitions and, and excuse me, understandings of mental illness is going to vary by our countries and our culture. So first we can take, you know, the medical, is it a medical condition of the brain, which is largely what I, I would say European countries and the United States are really using. Um, and we see that, you know, I, reflected in, in how we look at our ICD-11, we'll get to that in a minute, and the DSM. Um, so there's the medical condition of the brain. Maybe, you know, some countries might think it's maybe spiritual in nature, or maybe it's a, a weakness or a result of moral failure. So all of this kind of impacts how we um, understand what causes mental illness or what a mental illness is. And then, of course, then how we respond to it. We might also think about specific uh, diagnoses, the examples I'm using here, so depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, bipolar disorder, and psychotic disorders. Um, you'll get these from more of the medical model. So we, we take that cluster of symptoms and we put a diagnosis on it. There are two, um, the ICD-11 and the DSM, those are the two main ways that we diagnose these conditions. And you'll see that there's a great deal of overlap. There's actually an article, I think this first at all, I think this 2021 is in, and someone will probably correct me later, but I think it's in the Lancet. Um, and so that provides a good uh, crosswalk of the two, but you'll even see that they're not major differences, but you'll st still see some, some differences in, in between the two models. So all that to say, even when we're talking about mental illnesses, um, we're talking about, we can be talking about different things. And then lastly, and, and this is a really important point, needing to think about the severity and the chronicity. The World Health Organization, I believe, 
The estimate is about 970 million people worldwide have a mental illness. And thinking of these folks, right, that's a lot of, obviously a lot of people, and many of those diagnoses are managed effectively. So depression is a really common diagnosis here in the United States. Some people may have, you know, lifetime depression, but it's managed with access to health care for this particular person, access to treatment, and for some it's unmanaged. And others will have long lasting and significant impact on functioning. You can think about um, psychotic spectrum disorders like schizophrenia. And these will have greater impact on people and their functioning, uh, functional ability, cognitive ability in society. And I say this because when we are talking about, yeah, when we're talking about mental health conditions and the criminal justice and criminal legal systems, we're not talking about the person who's sort of managing you know, their depression for the last 30 years and managing it pretty well and kind of staying out of the law. What we're really talking about are folks who have um, significant impacts on their functioning. So I'm putting the National Institute of Mental Health definition up here, not because I think it's the best or that I'm endorsing it. It's just an example that we use quite often. Uh, so you could see any mental illness defined as having a uh, mental behavior or emotional disorder can vary in impact, right? Either from no impairment, but still having a mental illness to mild, moderate, and severe. So that's any mental illness. And then serious mental illness. Again, the, these are the folks that we're really talking about. Defined as, as a mental, behavioral, or emotional disorder resulting in serious functional impairment, which substantially interferes with or limits one or more major life activities. And so these are the folks, again, that we're, we're specifically referring to here within the context of this discussion in the panel today. And again, I keep mentioning this disproportionate high rates. So, you know, mental illness alone is not a problem. It's just a condition. It's when you layer on what it means to have a mental illness with serious impact on functioning and then disproportionate contact with a system like the criminal justice system, right? And so then it becomes a problem. Um, but we understand this, which is presumably why we are all here. We know that across countries, across continents, um, a lot of people have disproportionate contact with all parts of the criminal legal system. I think some studies will show, you know, even up to 50% of the population within the particular setting having a mental health condition or mental illness. Um, and so, you know, usually when I'm giving, you know, talks on probation and parole in the United States, the numbers I throw out there are 16 to 27 percent of people with or people who are under community supervision have a mental health condition, and that's about 750 to 750,000 to 1 million people. So we're talking large, large numbers. And then I, instead of just naming all of the stats, I just included just a number. These are examples. This is not an exhaustive list, but we have again across continents, across countries, lots and lots of studies of prevalence. Um, of mental health conditions in the criminal justice systems. And what I would argue, and I'll say it again later, is that we know this, right? I think we're getting stuck on what to do about it. So we're, we're, you know, we've identified the problem, we've talked about why it's happening, but what we're struggling with is what to do about it. And I think that's part of, you know, groups like this, it's great to come together because it's moving beyond studies of prevalence and into studies of interventions. So, um, the next topic I uh, was tasked to talk, uh, tasked with to talk about is the need of people, the needs of people with serious mental illnesses. And so this is where in almost the only time I kind of zero in on individual level challenges. Um, mostly I'm thinking about system level challenges, but in thinking about people with, you know, serious mental illness or severe and persistent mental illness, the obvious thing that comes to mind is really the severity of those symptoms and how that impacts um, cognition, how that impacts the daily functioning. And we know that there's high uh, co-occurrence of substance use disorders uh, among people with mental illnesses. And we also know that substance use and misuse um, is one of the key predictors of criminal uh, legal system involvement. We can also think about the difficulties in comprehending requirements, thinking about a person who needs to follow rules within you know, carceral settings, um, you know, complex, noisy, loud um, um, settings where a person maybe who's having some internal distractions is going to have a really hard time in those environments. And then, of course, comprehending the terms of supervision, which is why we see 
with community supervision, higher rates of probation violations and revocations among people with serious mental illnesses. And then you'll see too, just not maybe having uh, the insight sometimes uh, or awareness to, to even recognize maybe my own mental illness and how that's actually impacting uh, my own functioning. And I might not disclose that information to an agency. And that typically with detection, right, that's usually the first way to start getting um, recognized for, for treatment or at least further assessment. And then not adhering to treatment or not seeking treatment. Again, self-stigma is a huge barrier to getting treatment uh, and doing um, or kind of mapping on any kind of interventions. Um, hesitation or reluctance to work with agency staff, you might see that within corrections. Of course, you certainly see that with community supervision um, and, and the lack of trust and rapport at times. And then absence or limited uh, stabilizing factors, this is big. And so sometimes you see with people with serious mental illnesses within communities, um, regardless of criminal legal system involvement, there can be erosion of family and social support ties because lots of things that just happen over the course of an individual's life that can put strain um, but those same family and social support ties are also the things that help keep people out of the criminal legal system. So it's really tricky there. Of course, financial resources, the same tension, um, that can be a contributing factor to criminal legal system involvement. And if you, you know, have, um, you know, significant mental health uh, symptoms that are impacting your ability to get to work, to get out of bed, to stay at work, to keep the job, to keep your anger in check, sometimes you might have outbursts that's gonna be really challenging. And again, same for health insurance and housing. I will say uh, from a context perspective, the health insurance piece is maybe not as relevant across countries and continents, but it's certainly a major, major factor here in the United States because of the lack of um, insurance and the impact of that lack of insurance on um, access. So I, I actually kind of just started talking about this. this is, these are kind of like hypothetical yet empirical questions that we certainly can answer, um, but this may be where my own sort of knowledge of the vast literature may be lacking. But we, we already know that there are some studies to support uh, the notion that um, uh, greater sort of more enhanced social welfare states actually have greater support for serious with uh, people, with, I'm sorry, people with serious mental illnesses. We did there was a study, I think, in 20, 2022 that it looked at the association between welfare states and then mental well-being um, in Europe uh, and then age as a factor. So we do see some support of this, but we could think about in terms of context, potentially, you know, countries with greater wraparound service, more robust welfare, welfare programs or social welfare programs potentially could show greater support for people with serious mental illnesses because it's sort of baked into that model. And if so, does that enhanced support translate to fewer unmet needs? And if folks have fewer unmet needs, does that also translate to some kind of impact, positive impact and involvement in the criminal legal system? We can see how this potentially all lines up if we understand sort of the literature on what keeps people out of jails. Um, and some countries um, just may be from their you know, socio-political context, maybe more lined up to do that than say, for example, United States, and I don't mean to pick on the United States, it's just that I'm very familiar with what we do and don't do here. Um, okay, so moving on to challenges that the criminal justice system faces, some of these examples might be sort of um, leaning heavily on um, probation references, but I think it's still, um, uh, many of these are pretty cross-cutting across the different systems. So um, from, you know, the outset, I do want to note that Typically, the mission of corrections agencies, it's about public safety. And with high numbers of people with mental illnesses in those systems, we're sort of pushing on that tension a little bit, pushing on that mission, trying to get these entities to do a bit more than what they're originally tasked with doing. So I, I recognize that. Um, also, I recognize that definitions of public safety are going to be different depending on where you're from. So all that to say, um, typically, you know, corrections agencies, their mission isn't treatment, right? Um, you know, the by law here, um, they're supposed to be able to provide treatment constitutionally, but largely, you know, we leave the work of, you know, mental health um, and, and, and treatment up to those, uh, you know, psychotherapists, for example, not corrections officers. So I want to name that sometimes the, the biggest challenge is navigating that tension. An agency 
doesn't want to kind of go all the way into treatment provider, nor should they. Um, but really knowing that, you know, where does where does that boundary sort of end between sort of a treatment orientation and um, sort of the law and order retribution um, uh, orientation as well. So that that always seems to be a kind of a philosophical and orientation challenge. <coughs> Excuse me. Relatedly, I would say to the agency and organizational capacity. And so, you know, whether or not a system is set up to handle people with mental illnesses, you know, do they have a, a way to detect? Is there screening? Is the screening baked into a risk needs assessment, for example? Um, what's the organization's capacity to then follow up on that? So if you do identify a person who has potentially a mental health condition, using a screener, do you then have the capacity, the training and the personnel to move to the next level, which is typically assessment? And then if you assess, what, where do you go from there? And I would say many agencies just don't have that continuum. And the question is whether they should or shouldn't. Um, officer capacity, similarly, you know, instead of the organizational capacity at the officer level, you could think about corrections officers and community supervision officers, for example, you know, what is their personal capacity? What's their training? Do they have uh, de-escalation techniques? Are they, do they have, um, you know, training in how to spot the signs and symptoms of a mental illness, for example? Do they know what resources within community supervision, do they know the resources that they um, should be referring people to? And then speaking of those resources, again, this is within the context of community supervision, um, what's going on in the local community? Are there resources available? Are there mental health resources available? Some states within the United States have centralized locations where you can go to county-based. Some have many, many, many providers in a single county. Um, some countries will have a very centralized health service system and that process is uniform throughout. Other countries like ours, it's kind of all over the map because it's highly privatized. And so the resources here, again, that context matters, but ultimately within community supervision, you need someone to connect the person to um, who needs services. Concerns about officer safety. Um, this is always a tricky one to talk about because I think sometimes it's about, there's a little bit of fear and stigma within corrections institutions about people with serious mental illnesses there. And it's just, it replicates what people believe in society, right? And so people with mental illnesses, they're dangerous, they're criminal, they do X, Y, Z. Um, and so that can often get replicated within agencies. And so when I say concerns about, you know, officer safety, we have to figure out, are these real concerns or are these based on stigma? Nevertheless, the impact on the officer, what that feels like for them um, is likely the same, regardless of what that cause is. So that's something that agencies need to talk about and deal with. And then lastly, though, I say lastly, knowing that this is not an exhaustive list. This is just the last one on the slide. Um, so cross-system communication and information sharing. And so, for example, and I'll use probation and, and parole as an example, you know, if you're trying to coordinate uh, a person's treatment, meaning getting them to a service, mental health or substance use service from maybe a probation office, for example, do you have contacts with a mental health provider agency? Um, will they call you back? It's just stuff like that. And then what are the rules and regulations around what you can and cannot share um, with that other agency? So there's just a, a few of the workforce challenges. And again, in the panel, uh, I suspect we'll talk a bit more about that. And then the, the last section here is on interventions. And I just mentioned uh, previously that there's, you know, a, I'm not able to say what one intervention is going to work in any setting. So the way that I wanna kind of approach this piece of it is to just talk through maybe how we can approach interventions generally. And I've also already talked about how um, I think there's maybe too much focus, I shouldn't say that, maybe there's a lot of focus on individual level interventions. Like how do we get you know, forensically informed treatments for people, right? And so I'm bringing in the other perspective, which is how do we get to a multi-level perspective, a multi-level approach that breaks us out of the idea that the only thing to change is criminal thinking and access to treatment. Yes, we should still do those. I'm not saying we shouldn't. Um, they're great to focus on, but it's not the whole picture. So the whole picture is going to, again, vary by country. It's gonna vary by region within a country, probably towns within those regions. And then, you know, so many of the interventions that we might develop 
need to be done at that kind of hyper local level, depending on your context. So in, in countries where maybe, and I just sort of mentioned this, but where governance and administration of the systems is concentrated at the national level, there's likely going to be more uniformity in the interventions, how they're implemented, right? And maybe perhaps their, you know, effectiveness in countries like the United States that are, you know, very decentralized in terms of governance and administration, those interventions really need to reflect those resources in the local community. And that's what we see a lot of. Nevertheless, I'm getting off topic here, but nevertheless, when we think about multi-level perspectives, so we're talking about, yes, the individual level, we still need to address, you know, antisocial thinking, substance use, impulsivity, um, we, we need to address those stabilizing factors like housing and income. Um, and we have to kind of go up here. So looking at officer level, we might look at discretion, what's going on at arrest. So thinking about before they are in the jail, what's happening in those interactions at the arrest, officer knowledge of mental illness, provider biases. When I say provider, I mean like mental health service provider, actually. Um, so this is, or um, could be also at the at the practitioner level. Interorganizational level, so the coordination of care and the resources between services, how is that happening, if it's happening? Are there barriers that exist here that we can then build an intervention around to smooth out that process? Um, at the organizational or agency level, workforce issues, um, so workforce capacity, are there vacancies? Caseload sizes and jurisdictions, are they too large? Do you then build interventions around you know, making internal policy to cap caseload sizes for mental health caseloads, for example. Um, community level, um, the factors here, looking at resource availability, is it that um, the intervention really needs to promote specific resources and make them available within communities, housing opportunities? Do we need interventions that combine both housing opportunities plus treatment within a community and employment opportunities? Society level, so we've got, you know, issues related to um, mental illnesses, societal assumptions, so stigma, drug laws, mass incarceration, racism. So we really can't talk about criminal legal system involvement without talking about sort of the systemic factors like racism that can get folks um, disproportionately represented in the criminal legal system. So if we think about kind of using this multi-level perspective, we can then think about how do you, how do you tie the interventions potentially to these as well? The thing that I, I want to bring up here, and this also will show my limitations, is I don't I don't know whether sequential intercept models are also used in places outside of the United States. I like this as an approach to mapping. There is, I think, um, there's not evidence that these approaches themselves, you know, enhance effectiveness within a community. I think those studies are hard to come by. But what I like about this is that it's a good way to map and approach sort of a continuum uh, continuum of care perspective. So if for those of you who are not familiar with this, I suspect many of you are, this is an, a, an interactive planning process that you do within communities. The whole purpose is to look at the gaps in the services. The idea is that you can promote kind of collaboration across your different systems. You identify what you need, what resources and priorities that you have. But the whole purpose of this is to think about each one of these intercepts. So intercept zero is at community services. So this is before you even get engaged with law enforcement. What are those resources and supports that you can put in place that helps divert people away from the criminal justice system at every intercept? I like this because it's it makes you think of, you know, what are those specific characteristics of community services, of law enforcement, of you know, initial detention and courts and reentry and probation and parole, you know, looking at each of those, where can you add something that gets the people with mental illnesses out of the criminal justice system and into the local supports that they need? So I, I like this quite a lot. And this is the way I sort of think through interventions. And so what I did is I just took that and just mapped on a few examples. So that and this this is very US centric and I acknowledge that. So when you think about intercept zero at the community services level, again, this is just before someone comes in contact with law enforcement. Um, mobile crisis teams, for example, 24 hour teams that you can call and they can come and show up, especially if the crisis is mental health specific, right? Um, unarmed response, right, with law enforcement 
forensic assertive community treatment teams, um, all of this happening kind of at this intercept. There's growing evidence around forensic assertive community treatment teams and their potential impact to both um, improve mental health uh, related outcomes and improve criminal justice system outcomes. And then looking at intercept one, you've got crisis intervention team training, co-responder models, intercept two, um, here, implementing some kind of standardized screening process for your initial detention. So this might be a lot of times the brief jail mental health screen. We can talk uh, a lot about, you know, the, the biases that are baked into most of these standardized screening instruments. A lot of these are based on prior treatment. So prior treatment is usually dependent on who seeks treatment. Um, here in the United States, that's usually white women. So they're always going to flag higher on these kinds of instruments. And then who has access to treatment? Um, and so those there are some limitations. And you know, should we still use these screeners? That's up for the to the agency to decide. But we don't have like a long list of unbiased instruments that are really really great for these settings. And so there's just a caveat I think for all of these. Um, also, at intercept two, pretrial supervision and diversion. Intercept three here, um, problem solving courts or treatment courts like mental health courts and drug treatment court. And then intercept four, really working on in-reach programs. So not waiting for the person to be released from jail or prison um, to then start map putting a plan on, but really having an external person doing the in-reach work to start putting those re-entry plans and discharge plans around them. And then the last one, intercept five, the example I use here is specialty mental health caseloads. And those are the two, that's the example I just wanna just note here. Um, this is you know US-based example, specialty mental health supervision. Um, this is based on um, largely Gen Schemes work um, who really kind of laid the groundwork for this. The model in the United States, I'm gonna keep saying that because I'm gonna to go to an example um, in Germany in a minute, but designated mental health caseloads, meaning um, caseloads are comprised exclusively of people with mental illnesses. Smaller caseload sizes, maybe 40 or 45, ongoing mental health training for officers, instead of like a one and done training on mental health. Um, increased interaction with resource providers, meaning those officers can help link people to services. And then problem solving orientation can mean a lot of things, but this is really that mental health officer, that specialty officer is not just saying, oh, you violated the terms of your condition uh, or your condition or your supervision, you're headed to jail, but that officer can really talk with them about what's going on. So those are the, the core components of that model. This has been, you know, transparently. So our team has done this. Um, Georgia has done this. Um, I think Texas and New Jersey. So the number of the, the research teams are down here. Largely, this is showing improvement on mental health outcomes consistently. And then um, with criminal justice outcomes, not as consistently. And I will say for our model, it was either inconclusive with violations or we were moving in the wrong direction. Other models will say arrests are going down. And so it, it really kind of depends. And so that, that's the, the national model. And I do wanna note um, in two US states, so North Carolina and Georgia, there's these other sort of implementation strategies that they're using to enhance fidelity. Um, and I, you know, I'm wildly biased because <laughs> this is some of the work that we're collaborating on. But clinical case consultation, I think is a really good model. The idea here is that you are providing coaching for these specialty officers. That coaching is provided by a licensed mental health professional. So we're not trying to get the officer to be a mental health professional. They're not a counselor, but we're trying to get them to behave differently. And that's in a mental health uh, informed way. And then the second thing they're both doing is really increasing that networking with resource providers, having engagement meetings with service providers in the community really to facilitate that service linkage. So those are kind of two modifications that two US states are, are, um, are doing. And then um, here uh, in Germany, so I was excited to find this example, um, Morgan Heights, I think, um, 2022. Um, so how Germany has implemented this specialist probation officer. I'm not going to pretend that I know a lot about this particular approach, but I wanted to name it here because I think it shows variation in these models and how these models can be tailored to context. So mm -hmm. if you read this article, um, you can see that it closely aligns itself with some of the models in the United States that I just mentioned, but it also distinguishes um, itself from these models, specifically um, the officer 
um, based on my understanding. Uh, the officer in this model is a specialist, but does, necessar does not necessarily carry a caseload um, exclusively of people with mental illnesses. Rather, the agency uses that person as a way to address the objective. So first here, the specialist has the knowledge um, and provides consultation to the probation workforce. So the idea here is that you're really enhancing the general knowledge across the workforce. This is not really what the US model does. And I think that this is really impressive kind of to think about you're using that officer to do kind of overall enhanced workforce. And then the idea is that this enhanced knowledge translates to better assessments. And then being networked with your colleagues leads to this overall kind of professional exchange and improved quality. So if you haven't taken a look at that, I'm obviously not the expert here on this model. Um, and perhaps we can talk about that in discussion in a minute. And that's primarily, uh, I think, well, I'll make two points on this and I think my time is done. So um, the variation, uh, so thinking about implementation, this is where my implementation science stuff comes in. So lots of variation and context lots of complex interventions. You can't just add it here. I'll go to this one. You can't just add the intervention and stir. You really need to systematically evaluate the needs of the community and the organization, plan and think about what challenges you might encounter, foster that implementation climate, engage your leadership, start your um, start implementing your intervention. But it really, it's adjusting along the way, you know, taking models from other contexts and trying to implement it in one other context. Um, isn't easy. And so you really need a systematic approach to do that. And then these are just the concluding thoughts here. Um, the criminal legal system is not where you want to warehouse people with mental illnesses, with serious mental illnesses. We need to adopt a multi-level perspective when we approach intervention development. And that treatment alone is not going to fix this large problem that we have. And our criminal legal systems need to do a better job of responding to people with serious mental illnesses but it's not necessarily shoring up the treatment we offer in the criminal legal system really needs to be um, making sure that community care is there as well. And that, I think I took more time than I was allowed, Carl. I'm sorry about that, but I'll stop share now. <laughs> no need to apologize. That was brilliant. Thank you, Sonia. Fascinating. I really enjoyed that. Um, we're going to go over to the other members of the panel now for some comments. Um, but in the meantime, I'd encourage people to add any questions or comments that they might have into the chat function so that we can pick those up later. So I'm hoping that Shelley Turner has managed to join now from Australia. If you have, please shout, Shelley. I have, Coral. Thank Fantastic. you very much. Welcome. I've having trouble logging on, so my yeah, apologies. Yeah, no problem. So um, if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself, Shelley, and then perhaps you could just say a little bit about um, Tonya's presentation and how that might fit with your experience in Australia, if that's okay. Yeah, and I'm sure. putting you on the spot I'm a little bit now. <laughs> on that. So yes, hi, everyone. And again, apologies for the late join. Uh, so my name is Shelley Turner, and I am... Um, uh, substantively the Chief Social Worker for Forensic Care, which is the Victorian Institute for Forensic Mental Health in uh, Victoria, Australia. Um, I've been with that organisation for a, around three years and I'm currently the Interim Executive Director for our secure hospital known as Thomas Embling Hospital, which is a, an inpatient facility Um uh, our service has also prison uh, services and community-based uh, services as well, people with problem behaviours and a whole array of other uh, forensic issues. Uh, and my background prior to coming here has been uh, in academic uh, settings as well as in youth justice in a couple of states uh, across Australia. Um, and sorry, Coral, I did miss the second part of your uh, question or what you wanted me to, to speak to. It was really just to think about um, some of the issues that Tonya's just raised in her presentation and how that might yes. fit with your practice experience, really. Uh, yes, no, thank you, Tonya. It was an excellent presentation, the parts that I caught. Anyway, I did miss, it, miss the first five minutes. Um, but I think, look, there was a lots of areas that resonated, um, lots of issues around uh, shared complexity, I think, in how we deal with the uh, nexus between serious mental illness and criminal justice. 
I think one of our shared um, experiences in Australia is variation across our states and territories and our national approach to these issues, which causes uh, additional levels of complexity in terms of service systems and how they intersect and, and interact with one another and how people actually experience that. Um, I think uh, you mentioned one of the areas that I think uh, speak strongly is the issues of stigma that people experience both in our mental health systems as well as in our criminal justice system. So we sometimes refer that to that as uh, in the shorthand as the double stigma of being both mad and bad and how people actually can move forward from that. Um, I noted you were talking about some of the issues around intersectionality as well. So uh, for, for us too, I think there are particular issues that relate to women in these systems. They're a bit of an invisible and forgotten group and maybe particular to Australia. So a contrasting issue is the significant over-representation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, in our systems of detention. Um, the overrepresentation rates are eye-watering and think speak to the ongoing impacts of colonisation and generational trauma in Australia. Um, I think the other area that really resonated for me was your discussion around the workforce challenges. Uh, so significant variation in terms of the qualifications and the base level competencies required for forensic work in Australia. Uh, and not really much shared agreement about what the uh, skill set and the knowledge and experience for workforces in community corrections, prisons, youth justice should look like. Um, and then a big contrast in terms of significant levels of qualification and experience required for mental health and health workforces. And then thinking about how those groups uh, intersect with one another and work together. So, um, and I think you also did touch on issues of privatisation as well, which are also familiar challenges for us in terms of continuity of care, information sharing, and how we work across the various aspects of the service system. Um, look, I think I'll leave it at, at that for the moment. They're probably my initial thoughts uh, at uh, quarter to two in the morning for me. Oh, so oh my goodness, is that? Good enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I said at the beginning, I wonder what time it was in some cases. Yeah. <laughs> goodness, Shelley, I had no idea. Wow. <laughs> well, extra thank you for joining us today, then. <laughs> Lots of common issues there that we can pick up later in the discussion. Um, and I'll just pass over to Charlie now, just for his view from the UK where it's only yeah. quarter to five in the evening, so much more yeah, sensible we, time. We, we've got no excuses. No. Um, <laughs> I thought that presentation by Tonya was really good and very interesting to hear um, about the situation in Australia, but without obviously very much detail. I'd like to know more, particularly about the uh, community correctional services probation. Um I'm going to talk about the UK. Can I just say before I start that it's a great pity that one of our panellists today, um, Mr. Swart, who comes from that service in Germany that Tonya connoted, he's the manager of that specialist probation service in Germany. Uh, that's in Baden-Württemberg. And I managed to uncover that when I was doing the work for the Council of Europe and we were looking for examples of good practice. Um, and I think the European survey that we undertook at that time and what goes on in the UK on, on, on a micro level in the country of Europe is not dissimilar. So, for example, we found that in prisons there were mental health policies in 95% of uh, prisons. Half that number uh, in European countries in probation services. Uh, we found that only four countries out of 47 were recording suicide rates uh, in the community when we know they're very high. And I can say that from UK, we've been doing that now for about 20, 25 years. And we have an impressive series of data. Um, I think, you know, there's a seminal paper by a woman called Binswanger, Ingrid Binswanger, 
that looked at death rates when people came out of prison. And she found that in um, a big prison in New York, uh, in the two weeks after release, death rates were 14 times higher than the general population. Now, I'm not saying that all of those um, untoward deaths were suicide, although um, a significant proportion were. There were all sorts of ways in which people managed to die when they came out of prison, including, of course, overdose and including um, being shot, car accidents, but suicide was there. Um, and it's interesting that in Europe, this is such a uh, almost unregarded matter. The other thing that we put in the Council of Europe um, survey, and I'm sure Tanya is listening uh, with great interest, is uh, Tanya, Elena Tanova, who was the woman at the Council of Europe who um, was leading this work, really, uh, which led to a white paper. Um, training in mental health took uh, place in only half the number of settings uh, in probation as it did in prison. And, of course, you know, you've got the issue of the duty of care when someone's in prison. So, you know, maybe you could argue that, um, you know, all round some of those mental health issues are going to be addressed um, more uh, systematic. But nonetheless, it, it looked like a big difference on paper. One of the things that a lot of people said to us uh, was that, well, why do we need to train people in mental health and become probation officers? Because essentially they're undertaking a social work degree and they should have um, a decent working knowledge of mental health, mental illness, uh, when that's completed and they go into a probation post. Um, I personally don't think that that's enough. That, you know, I thought this notion of case study supervision that Tonya, um, uh, alluding to was a much more powerful means of getting the right, right response from, uh, someone in a probation service than, uh, other ones. Um, I think in England, a lot of the aspects of the model that Tony put up at the end there, we would say we were aspiring to. We have mental health treatment requirements, well, mostly with common mental health disorders who are diverted from the um, criminal justice system. And those are new services. They've been in place about five, ten years, and uh, they are seeing quite a lot of people we have liaison on diversion services, although the evidence is they don't actually work very much with people with a mental illness, let alone a serious mental illness. Um, and we have in reach teams uh, of mental health experts going into prisons, uh, but they are under resourced and have to make difficult decisions about priorities when there's such a lot of potential work confronted. I think it's interesting that the role of trauma in childhood hasn't come up. So uh, there's a very impressive study about prison inmates, again, in New York, by someone whose name I've forgotten. I, I'm sorry about that. Um, but she showed that 60 to 70 percent of people in prison had a significant childhood trauma, whether that was uh, sexual. Um, and I know that the probation service in um, England has been trying to introduce a trauma approach, uh, trauma informed approach to the way we look at probation clients. The big question is this What do you want a probation officer to do? What is their role in this scenario? Is it to be able to recognize a mental health disorder? and refer that person to the right expert? Is it to be able to assess someone's uh, mental illness and try and get them more deliberately onto the exact part of the pathway? Um, and if it's either of those things, how are probation staff being prepared to undertake those roles? And I don't think, personally, they are being undertaken. Those roles are being... Uh, isn't it? Because I'm not even sure probation staff 
know the answer to that and what is their role, uh, let alone going on to say uh, there isn't enough training to do what we don't really know. Um, so there are some big questions, I think, and the time has come, as Tonya said, to stop talking about prevalence. We know it's a major issue, um, and I think the time has come to actually start doing something about it. And, of course, that means things. It means bigger investment in education and training. It means uh, and coordination with mental, local mental health services, who themselves, in England and Wales, are really under the cosh in terms of their resources and how much more new roles they can be expected. So big issues and big challenges in front of Thanks. Thank you, Charlie. So really now it's over to the audience for questions. So if you do have any questions, then please do put them into the chat for us. Um, but I think the panel's already raised lots of different issues that we can start to discuss. Um, and one of them that stood out, I think, from all three people there is about what the role of a probation officer or, or practitioner or corrections officer, whatever we want to call them, depending on where you are, is and how that's decided. Um, and I don't know whether any of the panel could comment on kind of how that's been decided or if it is actually clear, if there is a clear policy around that in their country as a starting point. Because certainly in the UK, as Charlie says, there are there are fuzzy edges, I would say, to um, where that role extends. Well, from a perspective of England and Wales, we can say there was um, an education and training strategy for patient anyway, mm. about prisoners, um, that had a three-year shelf life, fired in 2021, which definitely said that the role was to us and refer on to the appropriate. Yeah. But we now know that that um, strategy, um, I'm on it, has run out, and I don't think we really know where we are now. Mm. That's all I can say for England and Wales. Yeah. Are things any clearer in the US or Australia? Uh, I would say in the US, I mean... Every state, well, let me be clear about that, the sort of governance and administration of probation and parole is different in every state. And so some may be, the jurisdiction may be at the level of the circuit, like in Georgia, for example, or county in North Carolina. Um, and so it looks really, really different. But what you then get is kind of a, a patchwork. Um, you know, where, where governance and administration is kind of at the state level, you'll have more uniformity and say like for a, you know, for a state like North Carolina or Georgia, for example, if that's their policy versus a different state, if it's county based and it has 100 counties, every single county can just make up its own, you know, wow. definition of rule or pro exactly. And I think more <laughs> often than not. So we did a, a, a survey across the United States to try to figure out what are those mental health focused probation approaches. And I want to say, it's funny, quoting our own work, I, I want to say it's maybe less than a quarter had mental health probation specific approaches, and maybe 30% had either a mental health court or a mental health probation approach. And so the numbers are really, really low um, mm -hmm. across the board for us. I wonder, Coral, can I um, just interrupt you slightly? Go on. Can yep. I, Ian Ryan and Jerry McNally. Um, had uh, a major project uh, underway in Ireland after the survey of mental health needs there that was undertaken. I wonder what their answer is to that question, given that that was then legislated, uh, the closer integration between mental health and mental justice service. Or is that putting them on the spot? <laughs> Uh, of course, it's putting us on the spot, <laughs> which is what Charlie always does. But I, the point, I think I would agree to a certain point with Ch uh, Charlie, and it reflects some of the other part of the discussion. Change comes slowly, 
And in particularly when you're negotiating between large organizations, it takes time and it takes process. And I think the most frustrating thing we all share is an urgency. We want everything to happen now. And particularly when you're talking about on a county level or on a national level, in our case, it's on a national level. So we're talking about criminal justice, talking to mental health, talking to all the other agencies. And it it can be frustratingly slow, but I'm learning to live, to realize that when change does come, it actually comes eventually. So it's it's about it's about not giving up and it's about being persistent, uh, and I think echoing. I see John Scott has a question in there asking about the uh, Council of Europe recommendations, which he, which has been sent, where they're developing a um, a recommendation for the ministerial uh, for the ministers in uh, the Council of Europe, and that's how things get influence. The Council of Europe influences policymakers. And I think it's that idea of influence and discussing and the, the weight of experience over time does bring about change. So I'm optimistic that there will be change, but I'm not optimistic that it's going to be tomorrow or today, but it may be in the near future. And I think as we work, as criminal justice begins to work more closely together with the health services, it's about joined up services. And that is uh, that's it. I think there's there's many many books written about how the how complicated it is to get it, it, different services to work together. I think we could all write a book about how difficult that is, but that's about we have to go step by step. And I think, um, as Charlie says, we had a study. We've learned a lot from the study. We're in discussions. And I do hope those discussions will continue to make progress while Charlie and I are still around to mm. to push each other on, on these points. But I am impressed that the Council of Europe have now moved on to the stage of actually having a recommendation from for the ministers. And I think that will be a major influence going forward. Got the recommendations here in front of me. And what they actually say in relation to that question that was asked about probation's role, staff's role in the recognition of mental health disorders and in providing interventions and or facilitating access to mental health care should be defined, thereby allowing the design of appropriate training. Definition of the role as being the first building block. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not defining a role then in those recommendations. Well, it's saying assessment. Okay. So identification of people's needs. Yeah. Okay. I think um, Jerry kind of raised an important issue there, which is about this, this relationship between criminal justice and health services. Um, and I'm wondering if if that's kind of part of the problem that, in a way, we haven't formalised what that relationship should look like in the mm. community. And it's maybe slightly different in prisons, um, but in the community, I'm not sure that we have the right structures in place necessarily to support closer working within probation. Um, I, I don't know how that would work in different parts of the world. I don't know, Shelley, whether your service, for example, would have that much direct involvement with community probation services. Uh, we do, Carol. I mean, our services is, is quite a specialist services, but um, as I mentioned before, my background has been in youth justice and community corrections, so I can speak to that experience as well. And I think the interface between uh, mental health services and sort of mainstream health services and corrections is uh, a tricky one and very similar to the way Tonya described in terms of various states and territories having different ways of organising and thinking about this. I think one of the biggest challenges is that there are competing philosophies really between those approaches. So I think um, in particular corrections and criminal justice still really largely dealing with an undeserving population, and that is um, very much at the heart of a sort of punishment mentality that still unfortunately 
permeates our approach to criminal justice in uh, Australia and to corrections. And again, that varies quite a bit between states and territories. And um, it depends also on the flavour of the government that we might have in that particular <laughs> state and territory. Um, and then again, the health services are very much built around the notion of recovery um, and a sort of non-linear journey where uh, a consumer or a participant or a client, whichever language you choose to use, is really driving their own recovery. So that sort of more voluntaristic conception um, of the person playing a central role and having agency in their recovery is quite at odds with the more controlling structures and systems that are set in place uh, in corrections. So I think that's a real tension that we haven't reconciled in terms of how the services work together. And when it comes to a forensic mental health service like ours, you really see those tensions play out across the different parts of our service system. Um, even in the language we use, which is uh, different where we refer to people in prison in a different way to how we refer to them once they come into a secure inpatient facility, for example. So I think we have a long way to go to develop any kind of unified way of thinking about this. or um, and, and, of course, all of that way of thinking uh, plays out in practice as well. You see quite a bit of confusion, really, I think, across the various parts of our service systems as to what we're trying to do collectively. Uh, and that, and that's just thinking about it from that sense. And then there are also, of course, the complexities of multidisciplinary working uh, alongside interagency working. Yeah. So <laughs> it's challenging. And yeah. I'll, I'll, Charlie, your comments around uh, the training for probation officers um, was, was interesting too because I know we've had similar debates and discussions in various parts of Australia as to whether a social work degree is the appropriate grounding or whether it should be something like a criminal justice specific degree, uh, whether it should be a diploma level, and then as to what degree of specialty around mental health, drug and alcohol, uh, trauma, you know, these are all sorts of issues and psychology plays a very strong role now in um, corrections uh, compared to, say, social work, which had a I think a much more uh, prevalent role in in the past, but we've seen a real rise of psychology um, in uh, corrections in probation in particular. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. How does that contrast then? How would you characterise the difference between a social work perspective and the psychology then that's that's coming in more um, recently? I think the social work perspective larger, and this is a generalisation, but does pay a, a lot of attention as well to the structural issues that might bring somebody into the criminal justice system in the first place. Um, and so in particular, when you think about our First Nations populations, that's thinking about some of the systemic disadvantages that might bring mm. someone into the system um, and also some of the structural ways of tackling that. So rather than I guess, locating the causes um, just with the individual. It's yeah. also thinking about those environmental factors. Now, I'm not suggesting psychologists don't do the same. I think it's just more the emphasis of the work and the way of uh, the lens. So social work really does bring that person and environment, the sort of interactional uh, perspective uh, to the forefront. And I think, um, you know, psychology and the prevalence of the risk, need and responsivity model uh, does think a little bit more around um, uh, risk mitigation and working with the individual and the individual factors. Uh, mm -hmm. And sometimes I think at, at the cost of thinking about things like the family systems uh, and, and the broader systems within which individuals find themselves located as well. So that would be yeah. my, my two o'clock in the morning brief description. <laughs> yeah. But, of course, there's a lot more in that. And, and yeah. Thank you. Uh, I can see Jerry's got his hands up, and I'm sure he'll have some something to say about that perspective as well. No, I, I just, I just uh, reflecting on basically what we've just heard there, I think there's also a, a complication within psychology and probation, psychology and social work and social pedagogue within the the, the probation profession as well, because yes. it's about identity and sense of purpose but that then crosses over into looking at the comp the uh, the institutions the relationship between the institutions between the police between the judiciary between mental health professionals and who uh, who leads and who follows and who delegates 
And it's about building that relationship. It's what I was mentioning there. It's a complicated business, building relationships between institutions. But it's an even more complicated one, building it between professionals. Yeah. And it's about, about it's all about boundaries and cooperation. And uh, I think we're, we're going into a whole uh, other area, which is quite large and complicated. But I wanted to just mention that there are a couple of very good examples of interesting developments within Europe, because in my time at CEP, the Confederation of European Probation, there's been some very good examples. For example, in the Netherlands, they have a, a community-based houses of justice or a meeting within cities where the various professions from the various organizations meet together and mm -hmm. share their experience on how to deal with particular cases and particular complications. And I think that uh, I've always found that a very promising one. And then in Germany at the moment, in Schleswig-Holstein and in Hamburg, they've recently passed laws which mandates the community services to work with people on leaving prison for a specified period to uh, to help that reintegration process. Now, it's much wider than mental health, but it actually is beginning to show uh, a mandate for, uh, being uh, obliging the services to cooperate. And I think that's an interesting model. And I know there's a particular candidate in uh, doing her PhD on this in, in one of the Irish universities in looking at how the German law is being implemented, because I know the Schleswig-Holstein law has been passed within the last 12 months. But I do think it's about how do we uh, get across professional and institutional boundaries for the benefit of the people we're working with and the benefit of the communities. And I think it's that complicated, stony ground that we have to work on. Mm. I appreciate there's obviously a lot of kind of local level variation in, in how people may have approached that. Um, but I wondered whether, from from people's experience, whether they had any ideas about how we can best kind of promote those sorts of interagency relationships and, you know, working, whether it's at practitioner level or at the level of the institution. Um, you know, how do we get those things off the ground and, and working? Because I think that's a kind of common stumbling block, really, when we're trying to think about how best to serve people in the criminal justice system that do have a serious mental illness. So I want to jump in here too, I think, and I'm really glad that the conversation went this way, because um, I, I think about sort of the, when I was referencing the multi-level perspective previously, one of those was the inter-organizational. And I think um, for us and the team, the team that I have here at the lab, um, you know, we felt that is a primary focus of ours. You know, we were able to describe what it can look like, right? Coordination, collaboration, or co-location, for example. So that's kind of like how we think through this. But what we're not really able to say is like, what's what's effective? What, it, what are we aiming for? Because not all situations, co-location isn't necessarily a model you want, right? It, it's not appropriate for everything. Coordination, coordination usually, collaboration, yes. Um, but figuring out what to use when and where you and your partners are. I think that's there's a lot of work that needs to, to be done there. And Coral, your question here um, around, you know, what can it look like? One of the things that we were doing in North Carolina, and this is a, a project that was funded by the National Institute of Mental Health, you know, we're really looking at the factors that impact the relationship or the, the ability to collaborate and coordinate between mental health probation officers and behavioral health service providers. And mm -hmm. that is very multi-level. And I think what Jerry was just saying too really struck me in that, you know, we're still taught, we're talking about these institutions, but we're still talking about people. Mm. And so the strategies that we think about, you know, have to be multi-level for that reason. So what's going to make me go and call Charlie to connect someone to services? Well, do I like Charlie? Do I know Charlie? Have I met Charlie in person? Have we had coffee together? So there there could be a number of interventions just around figuring out how to create that relationship. But then when you look at more of the institutional and organizational level, then you have to get a little bit more maybe formal in that approach. And so that might be MO, uh, memorandums of understanding or agreement or some other kind of processes. One of the things in this study, and this is not, we haven't 
we haven't found a, a publishing home for this yet, but it's going to come soon. But um, one of the things that folks had suggested is really, you know, either, you know, ongoing resource information sharing meetings, which I think someone had mentioned previously, that's on one spectrum. So it's info sharing, here's what we do. And then another part of that, people want um, treatment team meetings, you know, between the mental health officer and the behavioral health service providers to talk about people on their caseload. Those are different, um, accomplishing different things, but ways that we can start to tease out, you know, coordination, collaboration, co-location, where are we fitting within kind of what those relationships should look like. I think even when we describe all of those, we still, from a research perspective, we don't know which one to use when. And I mm -hmm. think that's the kind of study that would be interesting, but also really hard to do and hard to kind of um, tease out when you, when you factor in, you know, context. Mm. That's fascinating. I'm just seeing that we've had an, another comment here. Uh, in Canada, CMHA has developed a court diversion program, which is making progress. If police or courts are using this as a viable option, um, but still lots of work to get it going. Countywide. So yeah, that's interesting. I don't know if you want to say any more about that, uh, Maureen. No, nope, perhaps not. Sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we are. <laughs> Welcome. Hi. Um, by the way, I I find this very interesting, and I appreciate you know having the various countries' flavor because you know uh, each country will have their own nuances and kind of priorities for things. So, um, I will state up front: my focus is missing persons. However, and I've been doing this for about 10 years, supporting families, I'm finding more and more missing persons are in fact people with me serious mental illness issues. And to have police be the front door for finding these people without understanding the ramifications of you know, mental illness, um, it's very, very difficult um, to have the police do anything other than pick them up. And if um, there is a crime issue, um, put them in jail. If there isn't, they do a risk assessment, supposedly, um, from a mental health issue. But what I'm hearing from families is that my loved one has mental illness issues. Police knew that, and they still let them go. So families are saying police are not aligned with, um, in this case, missing persons with mental health issues. So how do we as a community broaden the perspective so that these individuals do get the help that's needed? And I haven't heard any, I was going to put a question in here, now I'll ask it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think um, initially, uh, Tanya, you, you spoke about the caregivers and the stress on them and the actually, um, to me, it's epidemic because now the caregivers are the ones who are having mental health issues. The police officers are starting to have mental health issues when they're being asked to form individuals over and over again, only to be taken to the hospital and either not given an assessment because there aren't enough doctors, uh, psych psychiatrists, or they're actually um, let go because they present very well. So it's a catch-22. And police are pushing back and saying, you know what, this is a mental health issue. This has nothing to do with us from a public safety uh, perspective. And we're seeing the landscape of that shifting and changing, which is a good thing because at least we're talking about it and we're trying to figure out who can best do what. So that takes me back to this court diversion program, which I never knew existed in Ontario, let alone in pockets across Canada. And even it was challenging because police, when they make the arrest, if they don't 
divert them at the front end, i.e. acknowledge that there's a mental health issue here, I should say mental illness issue here, um, they're already in the court system. So it, it complicates it when you've got court support workers who are trying to encourage the court to let this individual go through the diversion stream and get the proper supports they need um, versus, you know, convicting them and throwing them in jail. Mm -hmm. So, Tanya, you talked about, you know, um, the, the purpose of these institutions. And in my mind, um, mental illness used to have institutions that would deal with these people, not always in the, in the best of ways. Um, but prisons are starting to be that door. Um, and now we're saying, you know, well, they're in there. So you've got to provide all of these new additional services to deal with the mental health issues. So we're kind of creating a conundrum of, of mixed roles and responsibilities. And I, I truly believe community have the strongest voice. But I'd like to hear more about how the caregivers' voices are helping in that movement and shaping those solutions because ultimately they're the ones who are left with the responsibility of looking after their loved one when they have uh, serious mental health issues. And the other thing is if, if we really want to understand how are we garnering input from those who have the mental illness? Mm -hmm. Because they are the ones who ultimately um, are going to be either accepting or refusing these services. So what are we doing to understand their perspective and their needs? And that's open to the panel. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's a great question. So I guess the, the voice of the carer and the person with lived experience in all of this really and, and where that gets reflected. I might jump in if that's all right. Yeah, I was going to say you touched on it slightly earlier, Shelley, didn't you? So it might be a good place to start. Yeah, look, it's a very strong interest of mine, Maureen. So thank you for asking those those questions. Um, I'm just going to speak for a minute about um, my work, where we have a very strong uh, and growing living and lived experience uh, workforce. So workforce of peer workers, uh, people who themselves have experienced um, either serious mental illness or significant involvement in our uh, systems of mental health, uh, and they provide direct uh, peer support uh, to people who are current uh, clients of our forensic mental health system. Uh, within that, there are also a couple of uh, family and carer uh, advocates or consultants who also have experience of caring for or living with in some way a person who uh, they have a significant relationship with and, again, involved in the forensic mental health system. Um, and uh, I think... I've worked quite co closely as well with our groups of families and carers who were involved in an advisory group for our organisation uh, in helping us to shape our systems and services to be more responsive to the needs of families and carers. Um, they have a particular set of needs that are sometimes uh, aligned with um, the person who's in the service, so the service user, but sometimes might also be competing with the service user. So. Uh, I think of an example which would be um, the issue of family violence. Uh, so sometimes family members themselves have been a victim of the offence or they may fear actually uh, the person who's in our service. So it's not a straightforward uh, relationship and not a straightforward set of needs. Uh, for families and carers, there's a lot of issues around unspoken shame as well. Um, they don't often receive uh, support from victim support services, yet you might argue they are victims as well because they're often demonised in the media, uh, have been part of some of the uh, conversations or have witnessed some dreadful things that have occurred 
uh, within their own family units and sometimes have affected their own family members. So uh, I am working with colleagues in a few other states actually to try to look at how we can provide some better uh, cross-state uh, and jurisdictional supports for forensic families and carers in particular. So while our mental health systems do have some supports for families and carers, there is again that double stigma or additional level of shame uh, and silencing that happens once uh, people enter the forensic systems as well as uh, mental health systems. So I think these are really important issues and often quite hidden and there isn't one particular agency or services that supports families and carers. But as you rightly point out, that is often, again, where people will end up when they leave uh, our criminal justice systems or our mental health systems if they're in any kind of um, institutionalised sort of uh, service or support system. So I think it's very important and we probably need to pay a lot more attention to it. Um, and I think there are also some complexities in terms of how we uh, co-design or work with uh, families and carers as well as um, service users when it comes to statutory systems in particular, uh, where we can't really genuinely co-design because we've already made up our, our minds about what we think <laughs> the service system should essentially look like. So I think a more pragmatic approach to issues of co-design and co-production are really important too, uh, so we're not inadvertently gaslighting people uh, along the way. But I think I've seen there's some, some fantastic organisations like the Co-Design Collective, I think, in the UK, and other places that are doing some some great work and leading the way there. And I think our disability sectors have actually uh, streaks ahead of us, as well as uh, drug and alcohol services that have been doing this kind of peer work and peer modelling for a long time. And again, I think it speaks to the issues of feeling in many ways that this is an undeserving population uh, and, and, and should essentially be voiceless. So I think they're things we have to grapple with as well when it comes to uh, criminal justice systems in particular. So I'll leave it at that. But um, yeah, I think I think we're doing some great work, but it's in pockets. Yeah, I'd love to learn more about that because that co-production is um, something that I feel really really important in anything that we do. So if you've got kind of examples of where you've been able to successfully do that, I, I personally would love to learn more about that. Um, but I'm conscious we are running out of time now. We've only got five minutes left. Um, I have one quick question, if, if that's okay, and then I'll just ask for some final comments from each of you um, before the time is up. I was just curious about going back to training, because that seems to be one of the central issues that everybody mentions, um, about how, how in different systems we've decided what kind of training um, probation staff should receive, what they need, um, and... I think there's space potentially for kind of lived experience voice within that too, you know, in terms of shaping what that training might look like. So I, I didn't know if people had any kind of comments they'd like to make on that. What are the kind of key things that we need to have in place in terms of training? I think, um, and I'll, I'll start by saying, the limitation here is I don't know how how informed this approach is in terms of lived experience. Um, but I, you know, some of the the studies that we've done um, in the United States, trying to look at what our agency is currently doing, again, describing what's there, not necessarily saying what ought to be there. Um, I think a lot of the using mental health probation as an example. You know, we'll try to use the crisis intervention team training that you know CIT officers that law enforcement's often using. Um, but we see a lot of kind of recognizing the signs and symptoms and then figuring out like how to get the person to the thing, the treatment provider or whatever that they need. And I think those are those are like the essentials, but mm. I don't think it could really stop there. Um, it's it then it becomes like the skill piece, like how, the de-escalation techniques. That's I think. Um, one of the things that we look for across systems is like, do you have a de-escalation training involved in this? Um, but I think even more than that too is the frequency. And so is this a one and done training? Is this done at, you know, basic law enforcement training in the very beginning or, and, or do you have booster sessions along the way? How often do you have those? How long is it in person? Do you use case mm -hmm. studies? So I think a lot of that 
we can move into focusing on format. If we can agree on content, I think getting to a format, both for frequency and type, and how do you deliver that to adult learners who want to mm -hmm. do very skills-based stuff, looking at some of the evidence from training and adult learning to be able to kind of inform that. I don't think we're there yet. I've seen good mm -hmm. training, um, I think just in, in a lot of variation in training, online modules versus getting together and having conversations about stuff. Okay, about so yeah. more research to be done then by the sounds of it. Lots to learn. Um, so as we've only got two minutes left, I will just ask for some final comments if that's okay. And I'll, I'll start with you, Tanya, as you're on the, the screen now. Okay. Um, I think final comments, I think, is actually going back to what Shelley was just talking about and the idea, and I think what Maureen had brought up. I mean, what a system we might have if we actually asked people how it ought to look. People who are involved in the system, either through family or themselves, personally involved, and also, we are asking that system to give up a bit of the control, which is what they are supposed to be doing, is controlling. They're systems of social control. And so it's an interesting way, or it's interesting to think about how do we get to that spot? And then removing the barriers to participation for those families and individuals. How often do you see a person with lived experience in decision-making seats, not, not only just as a service provider, but where else? What else is that person available um, to what rooms are, the, are those, um, you know, individuals and in, what tables are they sitting at to be able to impact change at, at higher levels. Um, so I guess that's my Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. And Shelley. Uh, thanks, Carol. I'll make it quick. I, I just want to hone in on your question quickly about uh, the, the, the type of education. And uh, it's a big passion of mine that I think we really need to target people's practice skills for this mm. field. Um, I think we can talk theory all we like, but we always come to a moment of a boundary judgment where we have to make a decision in the moment in this type of work. Uh, and so when you think about things like de-escalation, but also just sort of very good, solid interpersonal and communication skills and how you demonstrate respect and cultural awareness in your work mm. along the way, uh, I think this really does require our universities and higher education systems and um, and vocational systems to be really targeting uh, skills-based and practice uh, type uh, experiential learning. And this is quite expensive. I think mm -hmm. we've come to a point where we've got very corporatized universities, uh, cost-cutting, uh, lots of academics who are driven by performance frameworks that are about research and not really about teaching or, or practice uh, delivery. So I think we've got attention there as well. But I think to add some moments of hope, I think we've got some fantastic uh, things on the horizon with VR and other ways of mimicking practice that can be quite uh, useful and helpful and things we should really think more deeply about because what you want to do is stimulate that sensory response that mm. people have in the moment and that triggers the fight, flight of, uh, or freeze yeah. moment for workers as well. So if we want to improve de-escalation, particularly in the area of mental health and law enforcement, having that type of practice skills training I think is really essential. So I'll leave Brilliant. it at that. Thank you. Thank you. And then finally, Charlie. Well, I was listening with interest, Shelley, to what you were saying about the nature of training that's needed. Um, I only wish there was someone in England and Wales who would commission such training. Um, and that strikes me as the, the issue. I mean, to be slightly less negative by way of ending, um, the Council of Europe now have made these recommendations, um, have considered mental health in probation and prison. And I really hope that that has some impact because what we need now is some action um, and, frankly, less talk. Brilliant. Thank you. I think that's a good place to end. Um, so I want to say a huge thank you to all of the panel members today and um, for all of your input. I've certainly found that to be a, a really interesting and useful discussion. Um, and it feels like there's a lot more that we could talk about, frankly. <laughs> You know, there's so many more things that we could ask and, and really get into the detail of here. Um, and it's great to see that so many people have attended. Um, we are intending to do kind of more of these events over time. Um, so the Hub will be running more webinars. So um, if people have ideas of what they'd like to see or, you know, areas that we maybe 
haven't gone to, into as much detail or you know didn't touch upon at all but you were interested in then then do please let us know um because we'd we'd love to do more of these and um see more of you in the future also um quick note from john that we'll be um sending out a follow-up questionnaire as well so um that's the space where you can kind of give any feedback um to guide us for future events but thanks very much everybody and um hopefully we'll, we'll see you again another time You have been listening to the INCJ podcast, conversations about international criminal justice. To find out more, go to our website at criminaljusticenetwork.net or follow us on Twitter at INTCJ Network.